Coming up on our newscast, President Yoon Suk-il appoints more officials for his cabinet. This includes a new KDCA chief and the Minister of Gender Equality and Family. North Korea's COVID-19 caseload reportedly exceeds 1 million. However, the regime remains unresponsive to Seoul's offer for help. Ukraine announced an end to its combat mission in Mariupol. This comes after hundreds of soldiers were evacuated from a steel plant. Hello and welcome. I'm Daniel Che here to bring the latest. Let's begin with our top story. South Korea has seen the spread of COVID-19 slow down dramatically in recent weeks. Authorities detected the first cases of Omicron subvariants that are believed to be more transmissible but are not expected to be a cause for concern. Shin Yeon starts us off. The spread of COVID-19 has definitely slowed down. On Tuesday, South Korea logged 35,117 new infections. This was the lowest tally reported on a Tuesday in 15 weeks. While the country has seen daily cases go down for weeks now, new strains of the highly contagious Omicron variant have been detected. On Tuesday, BA4 and BA5 were added to the list of Omicron variants now in the country. But health authorities say these new subvariants won't exacerbate the pandemic. The WHO hasn't classified either BA4 or BA5 as strains that could be a cause for concern. While they may be a bit more transmissive than the original Omicron strain, because they're subvariants, they won't cause more deaths or critical illness. What we know so far about the BA4 and BA5 variant is that they spread some 12 to 13 percent more quickly than BA2. BA2 accounts for more than 35 percent of all cases. Both BA4 and 5 are known to be much more contagious than the original Omicron strain. Also, a growing number of new infections have been traced back to the BA2.12.1 mutation. This strain is known to be one of the most contagious among all Omicron strains. Only a week after it had been first detected in Korea, authorities found 19 people infected with this mutation. Meanwhile, South Korea is continuing to ramp up efforts on the booster shot front. Though the country has lowered its evaluation of the pandemic's risk level, it stressed the need to remain vigilant to reduce the number of deaths and critically ill cases. In order to do that, authorities have asked the older adults to get a fourth vaccine shot. But as of Tuesday, only 24.7 percent of those aged 60 and up have received a booster. Shin Yeun, Arirang News. North Korea's suspected COVID-19 caseloads well over 1 million. While Seoul has reached out to offer help, the regime is instead reportedly getting goods from China. Han sung woo has the latest. A day has passed since South Korea reached out to offer North Korea medical aid, but the regime still hasn't indicated whether it'll accept. Seoul had on Monday attempted to send a fax message signed by Unification Minister Kwon young se to the head of the North's United Front Department, Kim young chol It's seeking to propose working-level talks about providing vaccines, masks and test kits, and sharing technical expertise. Pyongyang's silence on the matter comes despite the two Koreas holding their routine phone call via the inter-Korean liaison hotline Tuesday morning. That's according to a South Korean official who said the government has chosen for now to wait patiently instead of pressing for a response, adding that Pyongyang is aware of Seoul's willingness to help. North Korean state media, the Korean Central News Agency, citing data from the regime's quarantine authorities on Tuesday reported close to 270,000 more cases of what it's been calling a fever of an unknown cause. The figures were gathered between 6 p.m. Sunday to 6 p.m. Monday, raising the regime's total caseload so far to nearly 1.5 million, among which almost 820,000 have reportedly recovered. Six more deaths, meanwhile, have pushed the death toll to 56. In response, the KCNA reported the North Korean military has begun a round-the-clock operation of delivering medicine to every drugstore in Pyongyang. The regime's leader, Kim Jong-un, personally ordered their deployment on Sunday during a Politburo meeting, where he slammed officials for the lack of medical supplies. Members of the ruling Workers' Party, 
including Kim himself, have been inspecting pharmacies to make sure drug supply is stabilized. Under these conditions, resident movement is limited, so we prepare medicines and go out to deliver them to residents as well. This comes as South Korean media outlets, citing multiple sources, say the North late last month began purchasing medical goods through trade brokers from China. Meanwhile, three state-owned Air Korea flights, believed to be carrying health care supplies, reportedly returned to Pyongyang from Shenyang Monday afternoon. Han Sung-woo, Arirang News. The UN Human Rights Office expressed deep concerns over North Korea's outbreak. Officials believe the regime's latest measures, which include putting people under stricter isolation, could have devastating impact as they could prevent North Koreans from getting basic needs such as enough food. The UN office also urged Pyongyang to take measures that are necessary and proportionate. North Korea has been reporting more cases and deaths related to the virus. U.S. President Joe Biden will travel to Seoul later this week to meet President Yoon Jung yeol Expectations are high the two leaders could cover a range of topics during his three-day visit. Yoon Jung min provides a glimpse of what to expect. Economy and security are expected to take center stage when U.S. President Joe Biden makes his first trip to South Korea as president later this week. Although not officially confirmed, President Biden's three-day itinerary in South Korea reflects just that as it's expected to include a visit to the Samsung Electronics chip plant in Pyeongtaek and a possible tour of the heavily armed demilitarized zone separating the two Koreas. The Biden administration has been bolstering cooperation with its key allies on semiconductors in Air Force to take a lead against China, and DMZ has been frequently visited by former U.S. commander-in-chiefs from Ronald Reagan in 1983 to Donald Trump in 2019, where he met North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, along with former South Korean President Moon Jae-in. All of this is aside from the first one-on-one -on -one between the newly inaugurated South Korean President Yoon Suk-yeol and the visiting U.S. President on Saturday at the new presidential office in Yongsan. Although the final details of the summit are yet to be finalized, three main agenda are expected to top the summit table. The Allies' coordinated response against North Korea's provocations, especially in the wake of the regime's series of missile launches and signs of a possible seventh nuclear test, wastes up contribution on global challenges and issues surrounding economic security. <laughs> 미국 바이든 대통령과 인도 태평양 경제 프레임워크를 통한 글로벌 공급망 협력 강화 방안을 논의할 것입니다. 공급망 안정화 방안뿐 아니라 디지털 경제와 탄소 중립 등 다양한 경제 안보에 관련된 사안이 포함될 것입니다. The one-on-one -on -one will be followed by a banquet, which will likely be joined by the heads of South Korea's four major conglomerates, Samsung Electronics, SK Group, Hyundai Motor Group, and LG Group. There are also reports that the U.S. president has a meeting scheduled with former President Moon Jae-in, during which Mr. Biden could offer Mr. Moon to serve as a special envoy to North Korea. South Korea's top office officials on Tuesday denied any knowledge of this meeting. The upcoming South Korea-U.S. summit comes only 11 days since President Yoon took office, which is to be held in the shortest time since the inauguration of a new South Korean government. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. Discussions are in full swing about South Korea joining the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Decisions on becoming a part of the initiative aimed at reducing the global supply chain's dependence on China could be made when President Biden visits Tokyo. Kim Dami has the details. South Korea is in giving positive consideration to joining the U.S.-led Technology Alliance, IPEF, and a decision could be made next week during U.S. President Joe Biden's visit to Japan. SARS Foreign Minister Park Jin said this when asked in a parliamentary briefing Tuesday whether South Korea is going to join the Indo-Pacific economic framework. It's highly possible that the topic will be discussed in the summit between the leaders of South Korea and the U.S. I believe our joining of the framework will be decided at an IPEF-related meeting in Tokyo next week. The IPEF is a U.S.-led initiative to reduce dependence on China in areas including global supply chains and digital economy.
And while the framework is aimed at countering China, the foreign minister did acknowledge that Beijing has its own concerns about the effect of the IPF on the regional order. According to Chinese reports, China's foreign minister Wang Yi told Bak that the two sides must oppose moves to decouple economically and ensure that the world's supply chains remain stable and smooth. Some analysts say Wang's comments are likely meant as a check on this hard Washington Economic Security Alliance. Asked about that view, an official at South Korea's foreign ministry said only that the Chinese side did comment on maintaining stable supply chains but did not elaborate. Another ministry official also said that the first of virtual talks between the foreign ministers of Seoul and Beijing were friendly and earnest, with the two at times speaking in the other's language. Kim Dami, Arirang News. President Yoon pushed ahead with appointing two more ministers. His former colleague and former prosecutor Han Dong-hoon has been appointed as justice minister. Former lawmaker Kim yeon soo is the new minister of gender equality and family. The parliament convened hearings on the two but failed to adopt their confirmation reports due to objections from the main opposition Democratic Party. But Yoon exerted presidential rights to appoint them after parliament failed to reply to his request to send the reports. The DP condemned the move, citing a lack of a bipartisan consensus. The president is still reviewing whether to appoint health minister nominee Chung Ho-young, leaving two seats still vacant among the 18 posts in his cabinet. Yoon also appointed former Vice Foreign Minister Cho Tae-yong as South Korea's new ambassador to the U.S. Cho is currently a lawmaker with the People Power Party. He served previously as Seoul's top new convoy and as deputy director of the National Security Office. The president made strengthening the Seoul-Washington alliance a top priority. As for the new KDCA chief, Song yung gan University professor Pek kyung ran who served recently on the Yoon administration's transition committee, for vice chairman of the Financial Services Commission, Yoon appointed professor Kim So-young of Seoul National University. Ukraine announced the end of its combat mission in Mariupol after hundreds of its soldiers were evacuated from a steel plant. President Zelensky vowed to secure their return, emphasizing the need to keep the country's heroes alive. Min Su Kyun reports. More than 260 Ukrainian soldiers have been evacuated from the besieged port city of Mariupol after being trapped for more than two months in the Azovstal steel plant. They included more than 53 Ukrainian soldiers who were severely wounded. On May 16, 53 severely wounded soldiers were evacuated from Azovstal to a medical facility in Novo Azovs to receive medical attention. 211 more people were transported to Olenivka through a humanitarian corridor. An exchange will be organized for their return home. Regarding the defenders remaining on Azovstal territory, rescue measures are being carried out jointly with the agencies mentioned earlier. This comes after Russia agreed to evacuate the injured Ukrainian troops for treatment in a town held by Russian-backed rebels. Ukraine's deputy defense minister said the troops will be exchanged later for captured Russians. It's currently unclear how many soldiers remain in the steel plant, but Ukraine vowed to continue its efforts to save those left behind. In a late-night video address, President Volodymyr Zelensky said Ukraine needs Ukrainian heroes to be alive. Meanwhile, Sweden and Finland are speeding their NATO membership applications. Sweden's foreign minister on Tuesday signed an application declaring to join the U.S.-led military alliance, while in Finland, the country's parliament is likely to vote Tuesday on a proposal to join NATO, marking the completion of another legislative step required for it to seek NATO membership. The European Council welcomed the move and said it strongly supports the application of both countries. Turkey, however, has complicated Sweden and Finland's bid to join NATO, saying it will not approve their memberships because of what it perceives as their harboring of exiled Kurdish militants. Without the support of all NATO members, the two Nordic countries will not be able to join the military alliance. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. Major institutions are downgrading growth projections for the global economy, citing the war in Ukraine and tightening by central banks. A South Korean think tank lowered its forecast to 3.5 percent, a downgrade similar to the latest IMF move. Kim Jeon helps us look beyond the digits. 
The Korea Institute for International Economic Policy has revised its 2022 growth forecast for the global economy to 3.5 percent, down by 1.1 percentage points from its earlier forecast last November. In its report released Tuesday, the state-run think tank cited geopolitical disputes stemming from the prolonged Russian invasion in Ukraine, as well as tightening of fiscal policies of major economies as its main reasons. It said it's having a heavy toll on the global economic recovery path that's currently struggling with inflation and pandemic-induced global supply chain disruptions. Also, uncertainty stemming from a faster-than-expected key rate increases by the U.S. Federal Reserve are pressuring the Korean economy this year. A widening gap in the two countries' key interest rates are likely to impact the amount of capital flow in Korea, which has aggressively raised its key rate five times since last July to 1.5 percent in April to curb massive household debt estimated to be around 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars. Last month, the International Monetary Fund lowered its estimate to 3.6 percent from its earlier forecast of 4.4 percent for similar reasons while also citing slow growth in China. In March, the OECD has also signaled that it could lower its growth forecast by one percentage points from its initial estimate of 4.5 percent. Kim ji Arirang News. The government announced bigger subsidies for those making their living driving diesel vehicles. This comes as a price of diesel surpassed that of gasoline for the first time since the year 2008. The plan was announced Tuesday after a meeting of the finance ministry and several other ministries. The government will reimburse half the amount spent on diesel by drivers of trucks, taxis and more above the price of 1,751 per liter. The threshold before had been 101 higher than that. The aim is to have the bigger subsidy in effect by June and to extend it from July until September. A so-called stablecoin Terra lost its peg to the U.S. dollar, wiping out billions of dollars. That had some major ripple effects. Here in Korea, the creator of Terra proposed a rescue plan, but many investors are fearful of the worst-case scenario. Um ji has the full story. Following the recent crash of the top 10 cryptocurrency Terra USD, a series of other algorithmic stablecoins are also losing their one-to-one -one peg to the U.S. dollar. According to CoinMarketCap on Monday, Dues Finance's DEI token became the latest failure, trading at about 60 cents and had earlier dropped to as low as 52 cents. Tether, the third biggest cryptocurrency by market cap, also lost its prized pegs to the dollar. Its market value fell by 9 percent as investors pooled $7 billion. The plunge spilled over into the wider crypto markets as well. The reason this becomes such a problem, and you actually saw this instance this week, is that when the, the crypto that is being used, in this case Bitcoin, is being used to backstop this instrument, becomes incredibly volatile and loses a great deal of value in a very short period of time. Last week, the stablecoin Terra USD saw its value plummet, wiping billions of dollars from its market cap in just a few days. Instead of maintaining its value equal to $1, it crashed to as low as 11 cents on Monday, while its sister token Terra, which also goes by the ticker Luna, fell from an all-time high of roughly 120 U.S. dollars to a fraction of a cent. To Guan, the co-founder of the Terraform Labs, the company behind Terra USD and Terra, unveiled a plan on Monday to try to revive its troubled blockchain. He said the rescue plan involves forking the old Terra code and restarting in an updated version of the network. However, some crypto investors say they've already lost their life savings. One such investor in South Korea expressed concern about becoming homeless as the 550,000 U.S. dollars that he borrowed using his house as collateral, which he subsequently invested in Terra, plunged in value to just $50. <laughs> U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Gary Gensler on Monday sent a stern warning to crypto investors, calling it highly speculative, and urged for more investor protection, including market integrity, barring front-running customers, and anti-manipulation and fraud. 
엄지영 아리랑 뉴스. Moving on to other stories now, South Korea's Information and Communication Technology Trade Show Global Mobile Vision 2022 kicked off today. The event serves as an opportunity for ICT companies to meet with prospective buyers at home and from abroad. Lee d e h y n went to check it out. Global Mobile Vision 2022, one of the largest information and communications technology trade shows in South Korea, is being held for two days starting Tuesday. Organized by Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency, ICT-related businesses will be exhibiting their latest innovations while being able to meet with around 250 prospective buyers from all over the world. This year, the show is focusing on digital transformation. During his speech at the opening ceremony, the president and CEO of the Korea Trade Investment Agency, or COTRA, highlighted why such a transformation is necessary. Global companies are leading digital transformation in various industries, which is creating new opportunities. This means South Korean companies should also look to digital transformation for more advantages in business. The exhibition is divided into five sectors, including machine learning and AI, the multimedia content service, and metaverse. In the smart city and factories sector, a key area of focus for Korea's digital transformation, a partner of South Korea's computing giant Naver Cloud has come up with a smart factory solution service. South Korea aims to develop smart factory systems to boost productivity and create more jobs in related industries. An online live tour with Metaverse exhibitions was also being held for overseas buyers who were unable to visit in person. By accessing the online platform, buyers could look through each booth in real time and even ask questions where answers were translated into English, Chinese or Japanese. But it's not just South Korea's ICT businesses that can benefit from this annual event. Although there are some difficulties with the ongoing pandemic, COTRA will be working to further expand the event into supporting not only information and communication technology businesses, but those in other sectors as well. With South Korea's new administration focused on going digital by developing sectors like AI, robot and 6G, Global Mobile Vision is aiming to become a tipping point for ICT businesses to expand globally. Lee d a e h y u n Arirang News. A new breeding site of an endangered species of bird has been found in South Korea. The National Institute of Ecology said on Tuesday that it has found 91 black-faced spoonbills breeding on an island near s o c h e o n g u n in Chungcheongnam-do province. A first-level endangered species, more than 90% of the world's black-faced spoonbills migrate to the west coast of South Korea in the summer to breed. There were roughly 3,690 adult spoonbills mating in the nation last year, an increase of 500 from 2020. In January, experts estimated there are only 6,162 black-faced spoonbills left in the world. The director of the National Institute of Ecology said continued conservation efforts and research will be carried out. Seoul City received one of the world's most prestigious design awards for a kid to help people that attempted suicide from making that same decision again. It was one of some 3,500 designs selected out of more than 10,000 entries for an international forum design award. The Seoul Suicide Prevention Center designed the kit for people who ended up in the emergency room after a suicide attempt. It provides activities to help with their mental health recovery and it comes with information on counseling. The Germany-based International Forum was founded in the early 1950s and is today a global standard for excellence in design. More unseasonably warm weather is in the forecast for South Korea. Most regions will see maximum temperatures exceeding the seasonal norms by 3 to 7 degrees. Some places such as Gyeongju will see highs surpassing 30 degrees Celsius. This is what we normally see in mid-July. In the meantime, dry weather advisories are in place for southern regions and the east coast. On top of that, gusty winds are also in the forecast for the entire nation starting tonight. This will significantly raise the risk of wildfires and those near mountainous regions of Gangwon-do province should take extra precautions. Maximum wind speed will be gusting up to 25 meters per second. Morning lows in Seoul and Daejeon will start off at 15 degrees Celsius. As for the daily highs, Seoul will get up to 26 degrees, Chuncheon 27, Daejeon and Gwangju will be topping out at 28 degrees. For the rem-
remainder of the week, wide temperature gaps of more than 10 degrees are expected. Daytime heat will continue until this weekend. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world. And that's all from us. As always, thank you for watching.